welcome to Leadership from the Cross with Pastor Scott Tom. This broadcast is devoted to taking your ministry and life to the next level. No matter what the level you are at, let us help advance your leadership skills. Leadership from the Cross is a ministry of Cross Christian Fellowship in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And now, Pastor Scott Tom. You've probably heard the question about leaders. Are they born or are they made? Well, all great leaders are born at some time, right? (laughs) But they're not born as great leaders. Matter of fact, great leaders and speakers, when they first started out, were not so great. They are made. Now, they can go and make themselves a better leader or a better speaker. And some learn very early on, and it seems like they're born that way. They just are a little bit more intuitive and are a little bit more engaged on that growth pattern or that desire. And so they pick up things intuitively that most people could if they had that kind of interest in leadership or in speaking or connecting with people. But I would say that about, and this is not scientific, this is just my take over the three decades of training leaders, is that the ability that comes naturally from the Lord through our natural makeup and environment and stuff is only about 10%, maybe at max 25%. They come from an extraordinary family or background. But still, natural talent and abilities would only be about 10%. What am I, what am I talking about like that? Natural talent and abilities to be a great leader or speaker. You know, that talent would be something like being able to be very personable with people. Some people just are outgoing and they strike up conversations easily while some of us clam up and, you know, are sweating with fear because we have to speak to somebody publicly. And we think, man, they're just born this way. They, they're so personable. But you can learn to be personable. They didn't start out being that way. They may have accommodated that and learned that early on. But anybody can learn to be personable. Others would say that well, the, this person just says they're outgoing they, and they just have this mental sharpness about them. Well, you and I may not have quite that mental sharpness, but that doesn't mean we can't be sharp if we prepare well. If we learn to be prepared and we over prepare and we're prepared well, we might have to put a little bit more effort into it, but we would be known for mental sharpness too. And someone might say, but you just can't learn charisma. Some people just have it. Whatever it is, they have it. Oh, well, you know what? That's true, but not true. There's a lot that goes into charisma. And the base word for charisma is charis, which is a word that means love. And anybody can learn to love people, and when you love people and care about people, you really do become a captivating leader. And charisma is all about captivating people. You capture their hearts, you capture their mind, you capture their loyalty, and you can be a captivating leader without having incredible charisma. And this has been proven throughout the centuries. There are certain charisma you know, that is in certain type of people that differs from position to position and person to person. And there's some people that don't have great personalities, but they lead great companies because they're a captivating leader. Most people wouldn't describe them as being charismatic, but they are because they've captivated the hearts, the minds, and the loyalty of people, and they move forward. So let's cover three areas that talk about how to become a great leader, speaker, and there's many more 
points that you could go over, but you know, for clarity speaking, let's concentrate on three that we really want to narrow it down to help us succeed in leading and speaking. And these two areas obviously go in almost any area of leadership, whether it be ministry leadership or household leadership or in employment. But number one, success in leading and speaking does not happen with dumb luck. Of course, we as Christians don't really believe in luck, so to speak, right? But just by happen chance or whatever, there is things that that just happen in a daily routine that isn't necessarily planned. I don't think the Lord plans out every little meal you're having and everything. It doesn't fall into this defeatist fatalism that God does everything for you and dictates everything. There is some things that that we have this freedom in, and that's meaningless in our life, that we could say has luck or, or no luck. And so leadership, though, doesn't depend on dumb luck or happen chance. It is something that is helped by the Spirit, but it's not a gift of the Spirit. There are gifts that enable you to be a better leader, yes. But if it was a gift of the Spirit, there would be perfect leaders. Like ability to teach. God can help you with this ability, but God doesn't cause you to be a great speaker or leader. Because then everybody who's filled with the Spirit, who's called to ministry, would be a great leader or teacher, and that just doesn't happen. We know that it happens over time. So it's something that, unlike prophecy, we would have to grow in. So it's a process. Remember, even Jesus on his human side grew in wisdom. And leadership has to do with wisdom, with operating in a style that is complete with knowledge and understanding and wisdom. And Proverbs 9.10 talks about all three of these things. It says, the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Now, if you go through Proverbs, the rest of Scripture, it's going to tell you to get knowledge, to get understanding, to exercise wisdom. These things are not used as interchangeable words all the time. Occasionally they are, but for the most part, they are not used as synonyms. Knowledge is really having a grasp of facts, things concepts. Knowledge is the beginning stages. It's the first step. Many people don't even get to this place. They have no desire for knowledge. They only want mind-numbing things to happen in their life. They don't want to be challenged. They don't want to put forth the effort. And sadly, many Christians are in this phase. They, They never even get to the place of acquiring facts understanding or getting or acquiring things or acquiring concepts. This would be a person who's a Christian, but they never read their Bible. And there's a lot of Christians like that. So why isn't God working in my life? Why can I make decisions better? Well, you're not even starting at the beginning. You're not even reading your Bible. And if you're not even reading your Bible, you're not even gaining the basic knowledge you need to do the second part, which is understanding. So knowledge is just the grasp of facts. It's just acquiring facts, acquiring things, acquiring concepts. It could be acquiring skills, but there's an understanding then that follows. The understanding is the theory behind those facts. It's how things operate, not just acquiring things. It's not just the concepts, but why concepts work why things happen, and even fewer get to this point. You can read your Bible, but to start getting theory and how things operate means going to church on a regular basis, means going to Bible college, it means seeking counsel, it means using the facts that you've previously gained in prayer, in study, in leadership, 
That's how you start gaining the understanding. So you can have the facts of something. You can know something exists, like you can know electricity exists. Understanding would be that you understand that how the electrons work, at least a vague understanding of how electricity runs through wiring, vague understanding of what circuit breakers do or fuses do, how it operates. That's a basic understanding. The third thing is putting those two things together with practical application. And that's wisdom. Wisdom is having the correct application of knowledge and understanding. And very few pay this price. Very few get here. Very few walk in wisdom. That means that you pray with knowledge and understanding. That would be like an Elijah. That would be like a Daniel. They have power in their prayer because they have knowledge of what prayer is. They have understanding because they understand how it operates, how you you find the heart of God, that you're not just praying selfishly or blind ambition, that you're seeking these things, and then how to expertly begin to use that in a wise answer where you get engagement on your prayer. You see prayers answered. And it isn't just this powerful faith. This person has powerful faith. You can have all the faith in the world, but if you're asking for the wrong things, God's not going to answer it. So now you see how these things begin to work together. What does this have to do with leadership and, and being a great leader, a great speaker? This is the basic. This is why it takes time to get there because you have to acquire these things. So you begin to know and acquire facts about leadership, concepts about leadership. This is you start adding to the knowledge. And then, but you you want to grasp the understanding of leadership or the understanding of speaking, the theory of why things work, why things work for certain leaders and don't work for other leaders. And few even get to this level. Wisdom is beginning to put the facts, the understanding together. And this is where you start getting charismatic leaders, impactful leaders. This is the kind of leader that you want to get to and get to be like. Think about this. This is like Nehemiah. He understood the times. He understood the facts of what was going on to Jerusalem. But he had a great understanding of the king, how the king operated, how politics operated, how and what it took to put together a team to build the walls of how to cast a vision. But then he also had the wisdom and the timing of this is how we're going to apply this. This is how we're going to bring all these things together. Jesus obviously was an expert at these things. I mean, he knew how to operate in wisdom when even experienced people didn't. His disciples were very experienced after a bit of time with him, right? Sending them out, and they had power over demons and could heal sicknesses and could preach. But when he came down from the Mount of Transfiguration, here they are with a young man who's demon-possessed, a father who's struggling with his belief, and a whole bunch of people wondering what's going on and those who are basically verbally accosting the disciples, including the scribes, the Pharisees, the leaders of, of Israel, some of the leaders anyways, right? And they couldn't cast out the demon because they didn't understand the situation enough. They had some leadership, some training, some wisdom, but they needed to grow in areas. That's why this just takes time. So here's the situation. Jesus walks down from the mountaintop. There's a demon-possessed boy with a father struggling in his faith, believes in God, but is just struggling with the concept because no one seems to be able to deliver his boy. Then you have the crowd who's kind of gawkers, gazing, maybe saying a few things here and there. But you had the attackers who are the scribes who are attacking the disciples because they weren't able to do anything. And Jesus came down. He understood the situation immediately. 
And I think that the disciples understood the situation, but they didn't have a situational awareness and the wisdom to operate in that situation. Jesus began to address each situation according to the awareness of what was going on in that situation, the doubt of the Father, the attacks of the scribes. So what does he do? He, he rebukes the attackers, immediately rebukes the attackers. So he puts them on their heels, and, he, and it kind of pushes the crowd back a little bit. The young lad and this demon, you know, they fall to the ground. He's convulsing with him, kind of like a little seizure type of thing, trying to scare. And Jesus isn't scared. He turns to the father, and the father's scared. And the father doesn't know what to do. Do you have a belief? Oh, I have belief, but help my unbelief, right? And then he does. He helps, and he goes, hey, with God, all things are possible. Do you believe that? You need to believe that. And just probably looking in Jesus' eyes, he begins to help the father here. And then he helps the young man, turns to the young man, casts out the demon. And this is, this is powerful. Why? Because when they asked him later, why couldn't we cast out this demon? Jesus addressed it as you guys were lacking faith. They had great faith at this time, pretty good faith at least, right? And they've had cast out demons before. But their faith was being attacked on multiple areas. The confusion of the situation, the pressure of the situation, the crowd looking on, the accusations of the scribes and the attacks of the scribes, the doubt of the Father, the incredible scary acts of this demon— and it's hard to pray, it's hard to concentrate, and it's going to take longer, so you know, you're going to have to fast. And they just were kind of outmatched at the situation. So they had the, I think they had some of the knowledge, you know, I think they had a good grasp of the knowledge. They didn't quite have the grasp of the understanding and situational awareness, and then they didn't have the real wisdom to deal with the overall arching view of what was going on where Jesus did. That is power, and that is wisdom, because it's all those things coming together, the knowledge, the understanding, and then applying those to the situation, having that situational awareness and then applying it in proper sequence with the proper authority, with the proper amount of love. Doesn't that just take time? That just takes time. So here's the question for you. Since it takes time, and this isn't happening by just dumb luck, what are you doing every day to become wise? What are you doing every day to gain wisdom? Remember, wisdom isn't just the facts. So that means that you would have to be requiring or acquiring knowledge so facts, then you're going to have to be understanding those things, being able to see the connections there, comprehension of how those facts are used. And then the wisdom is using them in situations. So you have to become active somehow, some way in ministry. If God isn't allowing that, you have to be active in your mind without being judgmental. What do I mean by that? I mean that if you're sitting listening to a teacher and if you become judgmental, you go, oh, I wouldn't say it that way. You can't be that way. You've got to say, if I had that opportunity, I would try to do it this way. I would say it this way. I think this would be better. But that guy's learning, right? That teacher is learning, going through the process. They're gaining their wisdom you get it by by acting on it, by sometimes failing. And that's how the disciples became much more wise in the situation with Jesus, because they failed. But they weren't stupid. You wouldn't call them unwise. In this situation, they weren't, they didn't, weren't batting a thousand, were they? So you have to be doing something every day to begin to gain that wisdom. So 
if you're doing this, you need to test it on a regular basis. How do I test it? For example, if you are teaching and we get judgmental if we've studied teaching and we listen to teachers, we can easily condemn or put them down or I wouldn't say it that way or whatever. And we got to really check our heart. Now, you're probably not like that, but I have to check my heart. And one of the ways to humble yourself or to test that is to be able to, if you're casting a vision or you've led a ministry for a while or you just taught something, pull out one person randomly and ask them if they can recap your vision or if they can recap your sermon or what you just delivered, whether it be a vision or it be uh, something about the ministry direction that you're going, can they recap that? Hey, if they can come up with one major point, you're doing well. Because most people only have about a 7% retention rate if they're not writing things down and doing stuff. So 7 to about 20% if you just taught. But oftentimes, they won't be able to come up with one major point. And if, and if you can't do that with several individuals pulling them out, then you're not doing so well, right? you got a ways to go before you're a great leader and speaker. If they can come up with two or more points, man, you are doing really good. If they can recap the whole thing or if they can recap at least a couple of points, and if they can give you the why or the whys, right, the why behind what you were saying, if they can give you the why behind your vision, the why behind your point, oh my goodness, you just struck gold, not only as a leader but in a person because this is a person who's attentive and would make a great person to lead in ministry, at least if not now, in the future. So the first thing is that you want to learn and get in a acceptance of that it just doesn't happen. Point one, success in leading or speaking does not happen by dumb luck right? It takes time and work. Secondly, success in leading and speaking comes from the influence of other great leaders. You don't want to do it all by yourself. Find someone you can follow. They don't have to be perfect. Find that person that you can follow. If they're a great leader, it will help you greatly. Great leaders shorten your learning curve dramatically. They have already spent the time, the energy, the money to become wise. And if they freely give to you, enjoy it and appreciate it. And even if you're paying for it, even if you're paying your tuition for a professor or tithing at a church or whatever it is, some mastermind group or something like that, You know what? That investment is well worth it because they will cut your investment in half. They will cut your time in half of what it takes for you to get to where they are and have their wisdom. And I'll tell you what, you can even exceed that if you really work at it, where the student becomes a master, where you become a master teacher, a master leader in your vocation or in ministry because you found that person who will build you up, who will lead you. That is so important to do because if you're doing it all on your own or if you're hanging with people who don't care about leadership or speaking or ministry, they're they're just going to drag you down. Find the people that will build you up. Find the people that will push you. Find the people that won't make excuses for you. Success in leading and speaking comes from the influence of great leaders, influence in your own life and impacting your life and influence how they will impact the people around you. Great leaders increase your influence dramatically just by hanging out with them, by the nature of your being connected with them. That's something that can be passed on directly or indirectly. If they are leading you and 
in your workplace or in ministry, then it's great if they make a big deal out of passing on influence and authority to you. Remember in the Old Testament, when they would ordain somebody, whether it be the king or a priest, they made a big deal out of it, called the whole congregation together. They had a feast. They did great things. And they made a big deal out of laying hands on someone and putting oil on them, not just a little dab on their forehead. They poured it all over them. It ran down their face and their beard and their clothes. They smell good afterwards. They looked a mess, but they smell good. And they had this oil and there was no confusion that they were extending authority to them. Having a great leader who influences people and they pass authority to you, it immediately gives you influence and credibility right out of the gate. I had some great leaders and I have a great leader, but he, he really wasn't taught this. And so in ordination, because he was, he was kind of taught, you know, you don't want to pull people in front and you're not building up people and extending their pride or whatever. And so they didn't really lay hands on people. They didn't make a big deal out of it. So when I was called to ministry, they actually, there was a very quick prayer, no, no real laying hands on me. I didn't get ordination papers for months later, months and months later, almost six months later. And the problem was I was immediately placed over two ministries. But the people in those ministries, they, they didn't see me get ordained or have hands laid on me or anything publicly said nice about me from my pastor or my leader or the overseer of those ministries. I was just plugged into those ministries. And let me tell you what, I had immediate difficulties in those ministries. What? You wouldn't have any kind of difficulty in ministry and people accepting you and accepting new leadership. That never happens. What? What? Yes, it does. And if you've been in ministry any time, you know that it just, it happens. So I was put over the New Believer Ministries and over the bookstore. And I, I had people in both ministries question my authority and if I was qualified and they rebelled. Now, if somebody had brought me up in front of the congregation and said, we've trained this person, we believe in this person, God's anointing is on this person, we want to bless them in front of you, and we are ordaining them as, as a pastor. If, I was, if that was done for me, I wouldn't have had so much pushback, I believe. But because it wasn't, I basically had to struggle in my New Believers ministry and ultimately had to get rid of every single coordinator I had. There was five coordinators, and, and because there was backbiting and other things going on, I had to release and replace each and every single service coordinator. For first service, second service, third service, for evening service, Wednesday service, they all had to go because they all just kind of rebelled. And they thought that they needed to, they or someone else needed to lead that ministry. And that person probably was in ministry and probably could have led it very well. But it wasn't God's choice. And had people been shown God's choice, I don't think I'd have had that much problem. In the bookstore, I immediately had pushback. Not from everybody. I had a one assistant manager that did very well with me coming on. I think his feelings were hurt a little bit because he would like to have run the bookstore, but he got over immediately. He was a servant, servant's heart, but the other one did not. And I had such pushback that I, I had to fire that individual. And that's hard to get fired from a ministry. But I had to step up, and I had to do that. It was hard to win over some of the volunteers and employees. That's why now I publicly ordain in, in our service. And I make a big deal out of it, and I hand them right there their ordination papers. Right there when we ordain them. I show the audience. I show the public. I, I have them invite their family and their friends. Because it's important that their family sees this, and their friends see this, though, so that it's not just some thought in their mind in, in that person who's being ordained that somehow they're making this up. They're not really a pastor or leader. But if they see another 
pastor, leader, laying hands on them, ordaining them, and it makes it real, right? And I let the audience participate and pray for that person and agree with us so that they are not only complicit with it, but feel proud that they got to send out this individual. Their church is sending them out, and there they help pray for the ordination. So it's real powerful if you can have a leader or a mentor that would influence you and influence the people around you, and this will help you be a great leader rather than an average leader or not get to be a leader at all. The third point, the third thing is then do not be in a hurry, right? Don't be in a hurry. Great leaders aren't made, or excuse me, great leaders aren't born that way. They're made, right? And then it's going to take time to do that. The second thing is great leaders or influencers will shorten that learning curve. And the third thing then is, even though it'll shorten the learning curve, don't be in a hurry. It still takes time to combine the ability and the experience with character to actually get the wisdom. You have to mix in the proper amount of character in with the knowledge. Wisdom also is character-driven. People can be wise. They can know what they should do, but they don't do it because they lack character. And this is like so heartbreaking. You see great Christian leaders who have, they're great teachers. They're great speakers. And you're like, what happened? What happened was they lacked that that key part. They were in too much of a hurry and they did, didn't acquiesce to character. They didn't give in to character, which completes wisdom. So you have to have the proper mix of character. Humility in proportion with authority. So you may have all kinds of wisdom and authority and then not have humility. I don't care how much wisdom, it's never going to fully be accomplished or fully be seen in your ministry because it's not mixed with humility. And knowledge, we know knowledge puffs up. So you have to have the proportion with love and self-restraint with influence because you can have great influence over people and use it for your own benefit. And you need self-restraint to go in with that. Look, Jesus, who's the greatest ever in wisdom, in knowledge, in training, in in influence, it still took three-plus years with his leaders, and they spent every day with Jesus when he was teaching them, and he was exemplifying the truth he was teaching them. Then he slowly worked with them, sent them out two by two. Then as they came back, he would debrief them and go over things. They come back all excited. Hey, demons are subject to our commands. And he goes, hey, that's that's okay. But don't forget your relationship with God. Remember that your names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And he prepared them for the future. This is what great influencers do. They know that you're not quite ready, but they teach you in a way to help you prepare for the future. They give you advice in advance. I love that. And all this stuff that they're pumping into you, and you're like, oh, okay, okay, and I don't need that, and that's not going to happen. And then you're so grateful when it comes around, and you're like, oh, man. I'm so thankful I got well-trained by that individual because he was thinking in advance, giving us so much more. This just takes time. My pastor and leader, Pastor Raul Reese in California, Somebody Loves You Ministries, he spent five years after he got saved when God had called him to ministry, but he spent five years training in his Kung Fu studio as a teacher and as a leader in Bible studies 
before God allowed him to be a pastor outside of a outside of a little home study group or a, a Bible study group in his in his studio. And when I'm saying this, I mean he wasn't learning to lead in the martial arts. He was learning to lead as a ministry leader, as a pastor, as a pastor leader. Because for all those years, five years, he only had 25 people. Now he's got a God put him in charge of a mega church right now. And thousands have come to know the Lord through that ministry. But for five years, he couldn't, and it didn't grow more than 25 individuals. It would go up and down. But God took his time training him, preparing him, and he waited on the Lord. And because of that, he continued to gain wisdom and strength. And he was just an inspiration when I was there, one who pushed us in those areas of seeking those things. I mean, he pushed us in seeking knowledge because we were pushed to buy books and read them, to listen to audio files. And then he would begin to explain things to us. We would have meetings and Tuesday mornings with him, and he would teach us out of the scriptures. And so he'd begin to give us that understanding. Then he gave us opportunity to go and do things to gain that wisdom and experience. And he granted us that influence and put us in charge of ministries and gave me incredible opportunities. And he took his time with people and he let us develop. He wasn't in a hurry. He, t- he brought even young guys on and had almost no ministry experience or training and just slowly developed them. It was just a blessing. And let me tell you something then. When you get to that place, be thankful in the process. Be thankful for the instruction. Be thankful for the people. Be thankful for the opportunities. And be thankful for the path. Even though it's a long path, at least you have a path. And it's just worship him. Worship God. Thank him. Thank him for all these benefits. And don't be in a hurry. All right? That just, ah, such good stuff, man. Wait on the Lord. Develop yourself, develop other people, don't be in a hurry, and in due time, you're going to reap. In due time, you're going to be successful. In due time, you're going to have that wisdom. Do you want a deep walk with God and be used by Him? Do you want to learn from the best professors, pastors, and thought leaders in Christianity today? You can do this at a low cost and at your own pace at ccfcollege.com. It is a completely different type of school. The tests are about growing in character, not grades. We will add to your knowledge, but we really want to transform your life. Similar programs would cost you $18,000. However, the first 200 students in our program will get in for only $47 a month. After that, the price will go up. For information, text CCF College to 33444. That's CCF College to 33444. Or go to ccfcollege.com. That's ccfcollege.com. You have been listening to Leadership from the Cross with Pastor Scott Tom of Cross Christian Fellowship in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Check out Pastor Scott's ministry training school and his other radio show, No Other Doctrine, by visiting our website at crossfellowship.org. That's crossfellowship.org. Also, you can visit our Facebook page at Facebook forward slash Leadership from the Cross.